Okay, this is an oral history for the Rocky Flats Cold War Museum and the Maria Rogers Oral History Project of the Carnegie Library of Boulder. And um, I'm talking with Ed Potier, and today's date is November 3rd, <laughs> 2003, thank you. <laughs> and uh, my name is Dorothy Charlo, and we're going to be talking about um, Mr. Potier's work at Rocky Flats as well as other things. Okay, so may I call you Ed? That's right, that's, that's fine, right. sure. Okay. Can you tell me when and where were you born? I was born in uh, November 4th, uh, 1924, on a farm near Litchfield, Minnesota. Uh -huh. And did you uh, go to school in Minnesota? Or did you well, I went, I went to high school at, at Litchfield, and uh, I graduated in 1942, and then of course the war was on, and, uh, and a little bit later I, was, uh, I went into the Navy, and uh, and I was trained as an aviation electronics technician. And uh, when I got out of the Navy, I went on to college then uh, under the GI Bill. Uh -huh. And I majored in uh, mathematics and physics and minored in chemistry. And that was at what was then called Mankato Teachers College, which had already adjusted its curriculum to uh, giving arts degrees as well as teachers degrees so uh, and then when I was in my senior year there the uh, Atomic Energy Commission announced uh, that they were giving uh, 40 fellowships in radiological radiological physics 20 to the University of Rochester in, in New York and 20 to Vanderbilt University and my the head of the physics department urged me to apply for one, uh, which I did. And you, and you had majored in? Physics, physics and mathematics. And so I went on, uh, I was accepted to go to the University of Rochester. <clears throat> and this was a course in, uh, it was entitled Radiological Physics, but and uh, not too long after, a few years later anyway, uh, it became health physics, and uh, uh, so that's really the recognized uh, profession uh, that has gone down over the years. And so uh, it was about my uh, let's see, it was in I went there in 19 fall of 1950, and in the spring of 51, I decided I wanted to try to find a job in the Midwest or western part of the country rather than stay in the east. And I read in Nucleonics magazine that there was a plant going up in Colorado, which was, of course, the Rocky Flats plant, and it would be operated by the Dow Chemical Company. So I uh, wrote a letter to the personnel department of the Dow Chemical at Midland, Michigan, got a response, and as a matter of fact, a Dr. Beamer came and interviewed me at Rochester, and he was uh, for a short time at Rocky Flats after later uh, as was going to be head of the health physics and, and medical uh, department, but there was some kind of health problem and, and he had to go back to Midland, Michigan. So uh, anyway, uh, in the fall of 1951, then I was still at the University of Rochester and had an opportunity then to go to uh, uh, Nevada to the test site to work with the Los Alamos people for a month. It was November of 51. Mm -hmm. And on the way out there, I uh, stopped in Denver and the Dow Chemical Company had offices in, uh, on Glenarm Street in, in Denver. And I was interviewed again, and then I was offered the, the job to come back the next spring, which I did. And my, I started then at Rocky Flats on the 11th of June, 1952. Uh -huh. And so your training there in Rochester <coughs> had 
you had completed the training that I had completed the completed the the, uh, the curriculum that had been set up and it was ad administered actually uh, through uh, through the Oak Ridge In Institute of Nuclear Studies uh, and so the program uh, was to prepare people for positions it was prepare people they re recognized that there was going to be a forthcoming need for people trained in, uh, in which actually health physics is really radiation protection. So um, they recognized that and they uh, had started. I was in the second class, you might say. Um, there had been a smaller class the year before that had uh, gone through this program as well. And then from then on, the training uh, for that uh, not only continued at Rochester and Vanderbilt, but there were a few other universities in this that uh, started the uh, program. And this was oriented specifically to the, the nuclear uh, industry? Right. Uh, we studied uh, uh, radiation physics, we studied uh, industrial hygiene, and we had some practical work to go along with it with instruments that were used in the field at the time. And uh, three months of the year were spent in a practicum, which in the case of Rochester was at Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island. And at Brookhaven National Laboratory they had a, it was basi that's a basically a research uh, laboratory run by uh, ten universities in the eastern part of the country and uh, so we uh, our training there actually was to spend a week or two at each of the departments uh, learning you know what had to be done in terms of, of radiation assessment and uh, and so forth and had you um, kind of made a decision that this was a field that interested you or well, to be quite frank about it, when I when I went on from from uh, Mankato uh, to go east to Rochester, I I was a little bit in the dark as to what I was getting into. And uh, of course, once I got into it, <laughs> I followed the path, you might say, and, yeah. but and in the continued. Sense of you were interested in physics, but yes, you didn't yes, know exactly. uh -huh. yeah, right. Did that come as a kind of a shock to you? To well, I wouldn't say so because I, I uh, you know, I, 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 I would have to go into some phase of physics and nuclear physics uh, related, you know, the, the job was related to nuclear physics, so uh, that was fine. But then I had some more training when I got to uh, Colorado in the sense that I spent three days here more or less getting oriented. The plant was under construction and uh, I was sent to Los Alamos for the summer. I arrived at Rocky Flats my first day uh, on the payroll, you might say, it was June 11th, 1952. And, I, and then uh, three days later we went to Los Alamos New Mexico and uh, spent then the summer and came back about Labor Day in September. And while I was at uh, Los Alamos, I spent all almost all the time in uh, a plant down there, which was referred to as DP West, which was a plutonium uh, manufacturing facility, and it pretty much uh, had the same kind of operations on a much smaller scale. Um, than we were going to have at Rocky Flats when it went into operation. And then I came back from there and, and, uh, and went right into the plutonium building. I, I'd been given the assignment. I knew I was going to be assigned to set up the health physics operations in the plutonium building, which was building 71 at the time. And uh, so my job there was to, uh, we had quite a bit of time to do it because it, the building was still under construction, but my job was to make sure we had the instrumentation we needed. We had the kinds of uh, records uh, 
set up that we would need to to uh, have for for uh, radiation surveys and and that sort of thing and that we had all the equipment we needed and it, it involved an air sampling program and as well as uh, getting instruments that you could measure the radiations, the various kind of radiations we had there. And as well as uh, getting protective equipment. When you work with radioactive materials, you do have to have respiratory uh, protective equipment. Uh, and so we had to make sure we had what we were going to need. And of course, the three months I spent at Los Alamos was invaluable from the standpoint of, of, of learning the kinds of situations we were going to get in where we would need that kind of protection. So, so a lot of the of those uh, several months before we went into actual production, uh, we were getting that kind of equipment rounded up, and we were training the operating people and uh, indoctrinating them in how to handle radioactive materials and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Now, um, you probably hadn't gotten that kind of specialized training in Rochester, right? For no. Sort of work, that's, that right? well. That's that wasn't specialized. No, uh, we did we did work with uh, uh, some uranium at Rochester because we we did uh, studies, uh, animal studies actually with exposing animals to uranium, uh, and of course we did have uranium at Rocky Flats, which I was under under me and later later on but my first my first uh, job at Rocky Flats really was specifically for the plutonium area and so you had to have all the protective gear ready for right. all the protective gear as well as the procedures that's right ready to go. set up yeah and of course along with that we were we had to start building a staff uh, when we went into, into operation in the uh, 71 building, the entire building uh, wasn't producing, uh, we, we had some, some parts of it that they were uh, duplicated, so they weren't all producing right at the beginning that, uh, when they went into production, and later on they were. But uh, so we had to we had a find a, a staff, and to do that, um, we found people with, uh, uh, they were, you might say, uh, my assistants were people with, with uh, scientific degrees of one sort or another. And, and then we, we hired people with high school education uh, for radiation monitors. And these, these folks, we, we, uh, at the time, we had the liberty to kind of hand pick, you might say, which later on uh, there were rules that we couldn't do that. But um, so we sort of picked people who had taken uh, science courses in high school so they'd understand a little better what we were doing. So we, we had this staff and we had them trained. We, we did uh, mock up kinds of jobs that we knew we'd have to support maintenance jobs especially were were the kinds of things that required a, a lot more effort and protection to the people that were doing the work than than the routine kinds of jobs so yeah. so we we mocked up a lot of that stuff yeah, so people could could uh, learn what to do yeah. and here again the fact that I've been at Los Alamos you know and been working with the real thing down there I uh, we knew which direction we had to go. Yes, yeah. So you felt that the experience you had at Los Al Alamos was very important. It was very invaluable. Mm -hmm. And did you kind of, you yourself set all the procedures for like how, uh, for example, how glove boxes would be set up and that sort of thing? Well, the, the design of the glove boxes it was, uh, I had very little to do with that because there were Folks that had were designing that glove box that actually uh, had come from Los Alamos. As a matter of fact, the building superintendent who ran the whole show, he uh, uh, he had worked at Los Alamos and been involved with production down there. So, uh, and so uh, uh, that that 
kind of thing was already, uh, you know, established. So your so, role was just to ensure their protection. It, right, exactly. And then we had to have, uh, we had to have uh, capability for, uh, for uh, assessment of air samples. Uh, we, ha we took air samples throughout the building uh, and so we, uh, th there already was in place uh, an air system, the, a vacuum system that was, where we could uh, tap into to, to pull air for, through air samples. Uh, but we had to have a means of assessing it, so we had to set up what we called a count room. And went, went count room. And when you, uh, the reason it was called a count room is that the uh, the uh, detection equipment that you used actually counted the radiations coming from the filter paper on which you had taken your air sample. So uh, uh, you, you'd, you'd measure the radiations coming off that filter paper and then you would be able to tell what the concentration was in the air at the place where that sample was taken. Now the air samples then were were measures of uh, radioactivity in the air. In yes, the air. yes. Mm -hmm. And also we uh, we uh, had installed in our in our uh, large ducts that went out to the stack. We had installed uh, sampling devices in there so we could draw samples of air from uh, from those ducts. Uh -huh. And that, that would be uh, that's right. That would be leading outside and uh, to assess, uh, you know, what was going through there. And then there were some pre-filter systems before it went into the main filter system that filtered all the air going outside that we did sampling for. And of course, that was more from the standpoint of, of being able to tell the integrity of the system. Is it really cleaning the air before it gets into the main main filter plenum because they, you'd filter uh, the production air that was, went through these boxes where all the materials were handled and processed uh, went through anywhere from two to four stages of, of uh, filtration. Uh, a filter that was called a HEPA filter, high efficiency particulate air filter. About that. Yes. I didn't know what it stood right, for. and that, and they were very efficient. So um, uh, we, we sampled after those systems uh, in order to uh, be able to tell whether the integrity on those uh, was was maintained or not, and we were able to tell the building people then uh, when they should consider changing those filters. Can you explain a little bit about the filter plenum? A lot of people okay. use that language. In that yes. The, the, uh, there was about, the filter plenum spanned all the way across the length or the width, I don't know which it would be, but of the building. And uh, these filters, individual filter was of two feet by two feet uh, dimension. And these were stacked six high, and uh, I don't know how many across, but the total was something like 640 or thereabouts. Uh, so the, the uh, everything around the this bank of filters then was was sealed, so the air had to go through the filters when it came into into the plenum, and then it was pulled out the other side of the plenum by four enormous fans that sucked that air out and then blew it out to the stack. And that's, uh, uh, that's, that was the air pattern then in the building. Um, one of the other things we had, we had uh, uh, a filter system that for the air coming into the building, and uh, which did a couple of things. It, uh, Clean the air so the air was didn't have uh, you know a lot of dust in it. It was very clean to start with, and uh, and secondly, it helped balance the 
the air pressure within the building, uh, which had to be maintained within the production area at what we call a negative relative to the outside. So the office area, for example, if the air would tend to go into the production area, because you didn't want it to go from the production area into the office area. So it was very critical to maintain that, uh, that air pressure differential. And at that time, um, was there awareness of the need for respirators? Uh, we, uh, yes, uh, we set up rules for particular jobs as a precautionary measure, a, uh, an employee was required to wear a respirator. Um, and uh, very shortly into the program, we re well, I guess right from the beginning of the program, we required them to carry one with them at all times. And if there was any indication then that there was a release into the work, into the environment of the, of the, uh, uh, room they were working, that they were to put on the respirator and then leave. <clears throat> uh, we had uh, a couple stages of respiratory protection uh, from the, um, the simple half mask which covered a person's nose and mouth and, and fit over, over, the, over the, that part of the face uh, up to uh, fitting people in complete suits in which we supplied air into the entire suit. And if, so for the uh, very complex operations, these were usually maintenance types of things where they had to go into the production line and uh, actually repair some piece of equipment inside the line. So they had to, had to actually open up the line. You'd build a, a protective house uh, around it out of plastic and uh, they they uh, had to go into the plastic house and, and, and they worked from that inside that plastic house. You had a secondary containment outside uh, where the person had to literally strip off these clothes, uh, this suit before he came out of the, uh, of the job completely. So uh, it was quite an elaborate, elaborate arrangement to do that, but uh, but we had that type of uh, of respiratory protection, and then in uh, a few cases, we had to supply uh, uh, respiratory protection uh, if if there were uh, uh, toxic materials other than radioactive materials in the air or potential for them. And of course, that required a, a different kind of a filter, usually one that would absorb the uh, the gases or whatever, whatever that atmosphere might be. That 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 didn't happen very often, but we we had to have that sort of thing on hand. Later on uh, in the program, uh, we uh, we were uh, we went to full face mask respirators that. It actually covered the entire face, and uh, these. So we had we actually had a, a, a sort of a cat. We had set up uh, categories of, you might say, a protection. Uh, if we uh, if the risk was very little, then the half mask would be all right. If the risk was more, then probably have to use the full face and, and of course if it was very obvious that you were going to have to break the integrity of a, of a processing box then we'd go to the supplied air. Uh -huh. Can you explain a little bit about the supplied air? People talk about that. Okay, the, the supplied air, uh, well the early days our supplied air suit really was uh, um, uh, a plastic hood that you'd put on the person first and inside the plastic hood was designed in such a way that there was a, a uh, headband inside of it that carried a little uh, air tube that went down the person's back but it circulated around his forehead 
and uh, uh, so the air when it came into uh, in uh, would come through this tube and then and and distribute in, inside the hood, and then uh, that hood draped over the person's shoulders, and then you put on ex uh, extra uh, coveralls. Actually, they were cotton coveralls outside the. Uh, and they covered up the part of that of that hood over the shoulders, and uh, then you uh, you added uh, uh, extra booties usually on their on their feet, and you did you used a lot of tape. You taped the <laughs> taped uh, all the openings uh, that, uh, including the, the opening down the front where it was where the buttons were. And then you, the person used, used to have to have two or three pairs of surgeon gloves uh, uh, on, and you'd tape tape those at the wrist and, and so forth. So the air was supplied then, and, and uh, so the air came from came, the air came the air came from a central pump supply that was in in the on the second floor of uh, I'm talking about 71 building. Second floor of the building, and it was distributed through a, through a, a, a network of pipes, and so you had a place to tap into uh, in the working area. Now, in, in later years, we became more sophisticated with the with the supplied air suits, and um, uh, it, the thing about it is, in the early days, we were we were kind of uh, uh, feeling our way, I might say, as far as the equipment, because a lot of equipment was not commercially available, and we'd have to go to a plastic uh, company and show them what we wanted, and be, uh, do our own designs and so forth. So, uh, uh, but but in in later years, there were some some small companies that grabbed onto this and were able to uh, develop some things and. And developed uh, suits, uh, you know, that went on the market. And uh, uh, the the uh, suits later on were were much better from the standpoint that you, you get some air uh, throughout the person's uh, body. Where the, those early ones, it was pretty much uh, sometimes it was rather uncomfortable from the standpoint of the so of the hot. body part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, in the early days, they would use the supplied air when there had been some sort of accident or. Cleaning well, or most most of it was for uh, preventive maintenance, where they or uh, either preventive maintenance or to repair something in the in the operating area in the actual operating glove box, as we called it, where you had to break down the integrity of the box in order to get into the equipment. And and uh, repair it. Uh, so most of them were planned, you know, planned operations like that. Now uh, another place we would have used it would be uh, um, I mentioned changing the filters in these uh, pre-filter systems. Uh, uh, those that would have been a, a job in which which would have required the supplied air suit and uh, building a house. Uh, uh, where you took the filters out of the out of the system and and that sort of thing. And the yeah. kind of people that did that that sort of work were. Um, uh, they they were part of the part of the maintenance department, and um, uh, I'm not sure exactly if it was, if there was electrical work to be done. It would have been an electrician. If uh, there might have been uh, there might have been some of them that had to. A sheet metal person, or uh, uh, if there were uh, mechanical work, it would have been uh, that type of uh, ex expertise used. Uh, so you use whatever discipline was required. Mm -hmm. So, so that was kind of the protective work. Did you yeah. uh, get into kind of testing? Levels of uh, radioactivity. Okay, the uh, for the all the all the employees were required to wear a radiation badge. Uh, 
which uh, measured any what we referred to as external radiation. That is the type of radiation that will penetrate the body. And there was some associated with, with plutonium operations. So uh, we needed to measure whatever they might receive. So we did have uh, badges. And in the early days, these were uh, uh, film badges that had film on, uh, in them that, was not, that looked almost exactly and was really quite the same as dental film. And the, uh, uh, so those would be, have to be read then by, uh, uh, usually by uh, uh, a special lab. And we had, we had a lab in the department, not in our building, but uh, in the headquarters, health physics headquarters building which took, we, we would, some people would wear the badge for a week, some two weeks, and some four weeks, depending on the nature of their, of their job. And then these badges would be changed, they'd be given a new badge, and the badge would go to the lab, and they'd be uh, processed and, uh, and assessed as to how much radiation they'd seen. And then, of course, we were required to, to um, keep a record of, of all that, and there were standards which we had to live by, uh, which were actually uh, came from what we referred to as Atomic Energy Commission manual chapters, which set down the standards for exposure. Um, and so we had to follow that. And, and we not only measured the, uh, what we call the whole body radiation by a badge, uh, usually on the, on the person's chest or, but we also measured, uh, tried to measure radiation uh, uh, to the hands because a lot of the operations in plutonium, the, uh, the operator had his hands in the glove box and was actually working with material inside a glove box. So those had to be, uh, they had to uh, measure the radiation there as well, and there was other standards that re related to hand exposure, which we had to comply with. Now, as years went by, uh, dosimetry, as we call it, uh, became much more sophisticated uh, with uh, other devices other than film. Uh, uh, one very popular one was called a TLD, or Thermal Luminescent Dosimetry Badge, and that was a vast improvement over the over using film. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, was it, did it pick up things more subtly? Well, it was more from the standpoint of of handling, uh, of, of processing and handling and so forth. That it, it had a lot of advantage there. Uh, I, I I wouldn't say that we were that one was more accurate than the other, except the. Uh, the TLD was such so easy to process. You know, you didn't have to go through uh, uh, developing the film. You know, uh, uh, in which is very sensitive to temperatures and all that. So uh, it was much better. And there were there were other techniques developed as well as that, uh, uh, that improved that improved on that. So uh, how, how would this? You know, mo most lay people would think that. Uh, something like a Geiger counter. Mm -hmm. it, were these at all similar to? What okay, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, instrumentation we 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 used. The main uh, survey meter that was used in the in the building, uh, plutonium building, uh, we referred to it as a Wee, and that that was a carryover from the Los Alamos terminology for this particular instrument and it measured alpha radiation. The major radiation from plutonium is alpha, and uh, uh, alpha radiation uh, uh, could be stopped by something as thin as a sheet of paper. So um, the main hazard from, from alpha radiation uh, comes from uh, inhaling the, the source of it, which in this case would have been plutonium. Uh, so uh, the radiation monitors, or the f folks we hired to uh, do this work, all carried one of these 
instruments with him, and his job was to, uh, each was assigned to an area, and he did an awful lot of surveying of, of equipment and uh, of uh, surfaces and so forth to detect, if, uh, you know, any release of the, of the plutonium. One of the problems with the early instrument there was uh, the batteries were very heavy in it and it weighed about 18 pounds. So you can imagine a, a monitor having to carry an 18 pound instrument around all day long. So uh, uh, I mentioned that uh, we were really pioneers in a lot of ways so we uh, worked with a couple of different companies to try to develop an alpha detection instrument that would uh, be a lot less cumbersome to handle and we were successful in doing that with two different companies, the Everline Instrument Corporation in Santa Fe and uh, Nuclear Chicago uh, in, uh, in Chicago that came up, each came up with an instrument that weighed about four pounds. So um, that was a vast improvement. But that, that device was used, uh, like I say, uh, in the areas to check all the surfaces and it was also used on, on personnel. Personnel were not allowed to go out of the operating area unless they were either checked out by a monitor. They, was all, they were always checked out by the monitor before lunch and before the, uh, they left for the, for the day. Uh, we did have some self-monitoring devices that uh, were used at other other times that they they could uh, an operator could use on his own, but so they they use them for that. Also, uh, plutonium does give off some some uh, other kinds of radiation such as gamma and neutron. So we had uh, instruments that uh, measured gamma radiation. We had instruments that measured neutron radiation. Uh, and uh, these, however, uh, well, the, ga the gamma instrument was not used all that much uh, because uh, uh, there wasn't situations that where you had to use it. The uh, neutron uh, radiation instrument was was used on occasion because there was some uh, sufficient neutrons produced in the plutonium operation that you had to have some idea of what you know what was going on and uh, so forth so so those those were the three major what we call survey instruments that were used by these radiation monitors to monitor in the area now Geiger counter which you mentioned uh, is a uh, uh, what we call a detection device, and it mainly will measure gamma and beta and gamma radiation, but it won't measure alpha. Uh, so it had no real purpose in. Uh, so in, that, uh, that's why I yes. didn't hear anyone yeah. referring to Geiger counters right. with reference to Rocky. Right, yeah. Now, it's not that we didn't have them, we had some, but. Uh, uh, because they they were very uh, they were sensitive enough that if you had a had, we did have you see at the Rocky Flats had some some uh, radiography operations in which they made exposures using using uh, X-ray equipment as well as as radioactive sources such as cobalt and uh, in those areas of course uh, that's the kind of a, uh, not necessarily a Geiger instrument, but uh, you could use a Geiger instrument on a qualitative basis. But you, you needed instruments that would measure gamma in those uh, areas. So, and we had a ra we had a, radio a radiography laboratory in Building 71, where uh, the final product went through for for uh, uh, for a measurement there by those folks. Final product meaning, meaning the the trigger. Well, the, the 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 early days plutonium in the early days in '71 was not. Uh, I wouldn't. The term trigger is kind of hard for me to uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, use because I never really heard it used and never used it myself. 
uh, hey, the, the fine, the, uh, uh, yes, the, uh, it, it used as a trigger once we, I guess once we got into the, into the H-bomb uh, period where uh, it became the source of, of heat for, uh, for the reaction that goes on in an H-bomb or you had to have a fission device in order to have a fusion device. And I expect that's how the term trigger came. But earlier came by. on, that wasn't. No, uh, the final product out of '71 was a small piece of plutonium that was uh, that was uh, coated and safe to handle out in the open what, uh, after after you had finished it. And what what was that generally? Uh, what was the name for that? Uh, you know, the name for the. I mean, was there a commonly used name? For uh, that well, it was just called a component of of the of a. It eventually found its way into a nuclear device a weapon, apparently along with uh, uranium and other other kinds of hardware. So, uh, yeah. but uh, I, I'm really talking now up to a period, you know, of about uh, up to the 57. 1957, 58, and that's when, when a lot of the emphasis changed uh, over to the, to the, uh, uh, H-bomb uh -huh. type of thinking. And did that affect your work drastically? Well, apparently it did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we we were never privy to many of those details. So uh, so except uh, except we know we handled a lot more. Plutonium in a different place. There were other buildings then built. Uh -huh. See, when when the Rocky Flats first started, Building 71 it was the only plutonium production building, and it had a an, a kind of an annex uh, or a small building to the east of it that was waste treatment. And what it did, it took the liquid waste from Building 71 and processed them down to a point where they it could release the water um, into the into the stream you know it, it, and here again I mentioned the atomic energy Commission uh, guides that had been put out uh, they had guides for water levels as well as air levels so they had to bring bring this down to to those guides before they could release the water and so they had they had uh, Techniques over there of of uh, concentrating the the uh, what plutonium was in the in the liquid waste, and then that was became uh, processed into a into a kind of a sludge, and it eventually wound up as as waste shipped off as waste. Uh -huh. Yeah. But what you were saying then uh, suggests that y your your job was was clearly health and protection, so you weren't mm -hmm. necessarily privy to... No, and uh, you see, in, in the early early days especially, the compartmentalization of uh, security was 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 uh, very much in evidence. Uh -huh. um, kind of the need to know... If you didn't exactly. Need to know. The, everything was based on a need to know, and in order to get into the operating area, for example, in 71 building, you came through the outer guard post, you exchanged your badge for another one that allowed you to go into the office area. In order to go in the operating area, you exchanged your badge for another one. Well, if you didn't have a badge there, that meant you couldn't get in. You know, so it was only the people that were, they had to be cleared for a particular area and building. So um, you weren't just free to wander into another building and see what was going on. Yeah. What kind of clearance did you have? Well, we had the, the basic clearance was called Q clearance in those days. Yeah. yeah. So you had that. Before yeah, you started but working. the need to know was kind of a, uh, you know, a kind of clearance that that was an internal type of clearance. I would call it that, uh, where the administration could decide that you needed to work in that particular area, and therefore, therefore they would clear you for a building, and. Uh, it's so just so because you had Q clearance didn't mean didn't you mean get in that's right exactly, uh -huh. or were able to to know know all about the 
you know, the design of the weapon or anything else and that sort of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that even a person like yourself uh, had to be cleared for a particular building. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I had colleagues that were in a parallel position to mine in, in the uh, depleted uranium and the enriched uranium building, and I was not free to walk over there and go into their office and talk to them unless I was cleared into the building by their building superintendent. If I had, if I had official business over there, why well, he could do that. He could clear me in for that sp specific purpose. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but otherwise, I just couldn't couldn't just go over there, you know. Did that make your work more difficult? Not really, because um, we would have staff meetings. Of course, where where we we would go up to Building Twenty Three, you know, for a staff meeting with the person who was our boss, mm -hmm. and uh, be able to discuss common problems up there. Now, um, you, when, when the 57 fire came, yes. um, were you involved in... Well, let me back up just a little bit. I was in building at 71 until 1955, and at 1955 there was uh, some personnel changes uh, uh, that happened in the health physics department, and uh, I was promoted to uh, uh, health physics operations supervisor, group leader, I guess it was. I was promotion to health physics group, group leader. And uh, uh, so I was in charge then of the, of the uh, health physics operations within all the production buildings at the time, which was uh, the, the three that I mentioned. And uh, so uh, I was in that position then uh, when uh, Building 76, 77 was, uh, was built and, uh, and, and d during the expansion then of, of, of the various operations. But the 57 fire, yes, uh, or, or 57 fire you mentioned, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I remember that very clearly. Uh, uh, it happened, you know, so, and about that was in, the in 71, 71 building, right, no exactly. Yeah. And uh, what had happened was uh, there had plutonium, the me uh, plutonium metal has a property which uh, referred to as it's pyrophoric, and uh, which means it can heat up and to uh, red hot. <laughs> And it comes and, spon spontaneously? Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, so it had, uh, this had happened uh, at 10.30, uh, well, when I got called, it was 10.30 at night. Uh, it had happened sometime during that evening, and uh, it had, uh, in the <coughs> production box, excuse me, <coughs> which uh, uh, this material was, the... Uh, it had caused flammable materials to start burning, and these were pulled through the duct system into one of these pre-filter systems I mentioned before, and burned through those filters and into the main pl filter plant. And <coughs> excuse me. So this happened at uh, in the evening hours. I, I believe it was a Sunday night. And uh, so I was called out there, uh, and so I spent the night out there, and and we uh, we uh, tried to see if we had any. We we brought other folks out as well, and tried to see if we had any environmental spread. And actually, we we really didn't find anything detectable to mount anything. Not saying that there wasn't. Something out there, if you'd have had the, you know, could have measured it uh, way there down. Been claims that things, <coughs> something was released there, but you did not detect it at the time. No, at the time we we couldn't measure anything uh, that uh, 
was detectable. Uh, and of course, in order for it to get into the environment, it had to pass through this 150 foot stack, you know, in 71 building. And the, shortly after the fire started in the main plenum, the power had gone off, so the fans were not running. Um, so uh, it's hard to say, you know, that uh, uh, how much might could have gotten out, out by just updraft through that stack without some forced effort. But was it something at that time? I and mean, can you remember what you felt like at that time? Was, was well, uh, it was the first, uh, you know, one of the. It was the first real. Uh, experience with a very serious uh, situation that I'd been involved with and uh, um, there were a lot of a lot of decisions to be made and uh, so uh, we had practically all the uh, top management that you know were out there and and uh, we uh, we worked out a, an arrangement so we could get uh, people, the workers, out of the building and so they could uh, get home and things of that nature. And of course, the, in the meantime, the firefighters were, were uh, fighting the fire. So, uh, but anyway, we were, uh, we, we, we tried to check around the uh, plant uh, environs and also uh, we sent, I can't remember whether we sent somebody out that night to any of the highways or not, but we definitely did the next day just to measure, uh, try to get some measurements if we could. And that would be, you would take air samples then? In this yeah, and, and mo most of that was uh, uh, like uh, vegetation samples. Uh, and maybe some dirt samples from along the road or something like that, you know. But, uh, now, as as I recollect, there there was the um, much later than this, the the fellow, the scientist named Ed Martell, went out and took soil samples. <coughs> But that was much later, was it not? That uh, that was after uh, we had another fire out there in 1969, uh -huh. which was Billing 76, and it was subsequent to that fire that that uh, that that group uh, got involved. Yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. So that wouldn't um, at at the time of the 57 fire, there wasn't was there much concern outside of the plant. Not really, mm -hmm. no, no. So it's mainly you folks inside that were worried. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, what what was that like? Were there changes made because of that fire? Well, I think one of the uh, yes, there were some that uh, one of the major things was uh, uh, better filters. Uh, Non non flammable or uh, filters. See the uh, to expedite these buildings, uh, you might say, get them built and so forth. They use filter uh, filters that were uh, a filter type that was in existence, which was chemical warfare service filters, and uh, they were paper base, so they were flammable. So they uh, uh, they burned well. Then the the effort then went immediately into developing uh, 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 filters that, and I believe I want to say fiberglass. Anyway, they were they were filters that would uh, you know that were either non-flammable or uh, wouldn't sustain the burning. And those, uh, all those were re uh, then the filters were all reinstalled with that type of filter eventually. A after the 57? After the 57 fire. Mm -hmm. Now in, this, in the 69, you were there for the 69 yes. fire. Yes. Mm -hmm. How, 
was that was a different kind of fire, was it not? Um, well, it was different uh, in, in the, uh, I suppose, in the sense of how it propagated and so forth, but um, the basic cause was really the same. Uh, uh, it was caused by uh, uh, plutonium metal that had, uh, because of its pyrophoricity, had, uh, had uh, overheated and started some things burning. And uh, so uh, the difference, uh, I guess the difference was that uh, the main stack of 76, I'm not sure that it, there was much of any of the air found its way there, but I, I wouldn't want to uh, say that none of it did. But the main propagation of that fire was through the glove boxes, and we had these separate filter systems that that went out the the roof. Um, but you didn't have a tall stack so you, in the early early days, and and one of the things we were t taught when I was at, at Brookhaven was that that you either you know, you either uh, dispersed material in the air to make sure it wasn't uh, a, a problem, or uh, you concentrated the material somehow. Um, and so the idea of a tall stack was that you would disperse anything that came out of it over large volumes of area uh, and air, so so the possibility of getting a toxic concentration, you know, was, was rather remote. So that was probably the theory that went into building that tall stack. Um, now, when Building 76 was built, they didn't build a tall stack. Because uh, they, uh, they uh, I, I guess that, that kind of idea just sort of had gone away or something. So it, uh, you didn't, you didn't have, uh, your dispersal point then was really just about roof level for whatever might have gotten out. And there was material out on the roof. Mm -hmm. And there was material in, uh, in the nearby uh, 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 ground level uh, areas, there was a, a little kind of a courtyard area uh, in 76 uh, area there that uh, there was some contamination found in that so yeah from the 69 yeah but there there again we were quite sure we hadn't dispersed anything into the environment now you mentioned Mr. Martell and he was out east of the plant and he picked up some positive uh, indication out there and there was a concurrent thing that had been going on here that <laughs> I shouldn't say concurrent because it had been going on for a few years and that was the problem with the uh, drum oil field where we, where we uh, uh, had to store oil because there wasn't any way to process them and uh, contaminated oil and uh, also we weren't allowed to ship uh, liquid so those had to literally be stored until they found a process that would that would take care of this material. And in uh, in the storage field there, uh, then you did have some some leaks into the soil. And uh, so from the standpoint of what he might have found, we feel it probably came from that rather than the fire. I see. Uh -huh. yeah. We just have a few more minutes on this table, mm -hmm. and I'll need to change it. Mm -hmm. Just a, um, it, when that that leak, that storing, was going on, was that something that you were aware of at the time, or? Well, yes. Uh, uh, it had it went on over a period of years because of the uh, the. Uh, the difference between the operation in 71 building when they produced a, a, a end, end product of a plutonium metal there and the end product in 76 was that in 76 you had machining going on that required a, a coolant. 71 you didn't require a coolant. So that coolant 
would reach a point where it was no longer, uh, you know, uh, usable. Something had to be done with it, and it was uh, it was a mixture of carbon tetrachloride and, and an oil of some kind, and so uh, uh, they didn't come up with a process to uh, to t get the contamination out of that mixture. Uh, so they had to store it, and uh, they wound up storing it outside. And so that went over, uh, went on over the period of time. Well, in the meantime, we had we had found some, because uh, we had that was the, the what we called our site survey group. They were uh, part of their operation of of, uh, of making measurements around the site was to oversee that barrel storage area, and they they did discover. Did a, some leaking there, mm -hmm. and there were sort of remedial measures taken to wh wherever leaks were, you know, were found. But uh, uh, anyway, that's well, let's stop for okay. now, and I'll change the tape. Continuation of the oral history with Ed Poussier, uh, and. Actually, I don't think I said before, um, we're talking in his apartment in uh, Fraser Meadow Manor. Um, so we, we were talking about um, the, the leaking of the drums. Yes. Yeah. Do you want to say anything more about that? Well, um, not, not really, uh, except that uh, Eventually, they did find a process to to work them, and then that was that was a quite an elaborate job then to get get that material uh, the liquid material down uh, to the building where it was processed, and um, then of course the problems that came after getting the drums off from the field, uh, you know that they mounted because then you expose the ground to uh, to the elements and uh, so we're quite sure that it was at that point then during that period before it got sealed uh, you seal the, the ground area that uh, probably the material that went off that went to the east because the prevailing wind is in the west uh, was probably resulted in what Mr. Martell found then. At least that's my opinion. I think it's shared with a number of other yeah. people. And the, the sealing over of that <coughs> area is what's called the 903 pad. That's, that's the 903 pad, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, did you personally have anything to do with that? Or? Well, uh, we, we uh, I guess about all I can say about that is we were urging our engineering department and the uh, Atomic Energy Commission or whatever it was called at the time uh, to uh, do the job as fast as they could that you know because we we realized that there were we had we had air samples air samplers to the east there that were definitely showing that that material was was going in that direction were you worried about it? <clears throat> well, to a degree, yes. We uh, we it, we'd rather it not be that way. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we we were weren't sure, you know. Uh, there was still a long ways before you got to the off government property, but we we weren't sure how far it could propagate. Uh, uh, so we wanted the place sealed as rapidly as it could. Now, did you have much to do with uh, measuring, with, with dealing with workers who had had accidents or some kind of <coughs> contamination? Or well, uh, yes, uh, to a degree. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first, the first real accident we had was in uh, uh, also in 1957 involving uh, 
uh, persons. We had a uh, chemical explosion in uh, June of uh, of uh, 57 in uh, building 71 and uh, the result of the explosion was such that that there were two employees that were uh, literally peppered with flying uh, glass because the inside this processing glove box uh, was a long tube of Pyrex glass in which the reaction was taking place and there were uh, some problems associated with the with the material in there that caused it to uh, overpressurize and literally uh, blow up, you might say. And these people were in the area and close enough by that they were they were peppered with uh, flying glass from this. So uh, uh, one of the things that I was involved with was to. Uh, try to determine uh, what, what, you know, what, how much they received and, and, uh, and try to see what we could do about the material that might have got into their, into their wounds. So uh, it was at that time that I suggested to, the, to our head of our department that uh, we should bring up an instrument that I knew existed in 91 building called a gamma spectrometer. And there was enough uh, X radiation associated with plutonium that we might be able to measure the radiation or at least detect radiation in a person's skin, under the person's skin where these things had lodged. So, so anyway, that was the beginning of a, of a device we call the wound counter. And uh, anyway, we were able to work with the surgeon then, or the uh, our plant doctor, and and advise them, you know, uh, what was in, in a wound. And and in many, uh, from then on, then uh, there there were a number of cases uh, where people would cut themselves during the operations, or or puncture themselves, or something and uh, there would be plutonium in the wound and we were able to advise the surgeon then uh, if there was material there and then he would frequently excise and through some techniques we developed we were able to help him until he was certain he had done as much as he could do and lots of times that would mean that he had removed all the plutonium. So, And so <clears throat> there were a number of cases that occurred uh, over over the years, especially in the machining of plutonium, because there were there were fine pieces you you can imagine that would stick through the glove, and they, and the person would stick his fingers literally. Uh, it might happen. Uh, so uh, so that that wound counter was used over the years to a great extent. And uh, then as far as the um, treatment of these people. Uh, those two individuals were the first ones that and we, we advised and worked with the, with the medical department on this too. Uh, um, we used a chelating agent that was given to the individuals inter, intravenously. The idea being that it enhanced the excretion of anything that might have got into the into the uh, bloodstream of the individual. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the chelating agent at the time was a material called EDTA, which stood for something like ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid, I believe it is. And it had been used in the lead industry or for treating pe people who had been exposed to lead and been very effective there. Well, it, it was fairly effective for plutonium as well. It would enhance the excretion considerably. And as time went on, there, were, there was another chelating agent that was developed that uh, <clears throat> was more efficient than even the EDTA and that, and that was used. So. So uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we worked with the medical department uh, uh, 
you know, in any way we could to, uh, to help take care of these people. And there was al always the problem in the medical department when you had some of the, someone like this uh, come into that area that you had to have a radiation monitor there because there was plutonium involved and to make sure it didn't get spread in, you know, in the, that area. But you didn't actually directly supervise the medical department? No, uh, no, were no. We, we, were, we were working with them and, you know, like a technician might be standing alongside or a nurse might be standing alongside a, uh, a doctor and, uh, and doing certain tasks that had to be done. <laughs> yeah. 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 What, what were the things that worried you the most during the years that you were there? Uh, or did those things change? Well, I'm not sure if worry is the right word, but, uh, you know, we were always concerned uh, over uh, someone uh, getting, uh, getting overexposed to the point where they would uh, uh, really show effects. I, I'm not sure that there's ever been anybody that has been shown to really have uh, had cancer that was really caused by that. However, sometimes, uh, I guess in these days, uh, uh, you give them the benefit of the doubt that maybe it was, you know, if cancer, they get cancer or something like that. Uh, but there was always that concern and uh, that uh, you would overexpose a person to the point where he was, his health would be definitely affected. Um, one of the other concerns we had over the years, of course, which uh, I wasn't directly involved with, but <clears throat> uh, but we at Rocky Flats, we were fortunate. We never had <clears throat> uh, an accident called a criticality accident, uh, which had been experienced at other labs, and people had been actually killed by the radiation associated with them. Um, we had an excellent uh, department of physicists who uh, spent full time in, in the what we call nuclear safety, which was to prevent uh, anything like that happening. Uh, most of it was in uh, uh, in developing procedures and uh, required to handle the material safely. Uh, in safe geometries, as they, as they would say, and uh, to transport in safe geometries. And uh, so anyway, I always, you know, that, was, that would have been a real serious situation if we ever had one of those. So I think, I think we all, all had in the back of our mind a worry. It happened at Los Alamos, it's happened at Oak Ridge. It, you know, uh, can it happen here, uh, sort of thing, which it didn't. So. Did you worry about that during the fires? Um, not really. I know there were there was concern expressed uh, outside the plant, you know, uh, about that. Uh, but uh, no, we uh, I didn't worry about it because I couldn't see any situation that could develop that would create the kind of configuration that would cause that kind of accident. Um, I know there's, you know, like I say, there were people outside the plant that raised raised the question, but here again we had uh, we had dosimetry badges on practically everybody in those buildings, and uh, had any of that kind of radiation uh, or that uh, anything had happened in that kind of an accident, we'd have been able to measure some radiation on those badges that would have been associated with the with the accident itself. <clears throat> At, now let's see, the issues that came up with beryllium would have been, were they after you uh, left? <clears throat> Pretty much. Uh, I, uh, I can't recall, see I, I retired, uh, my last day of work was uh, the day before Thanksgiving of, of uh, 82 and frankly I can't recall any any uh, 
issues or cases of beryllium disease before that. Whether there was, I, I can't say whether there was or not, but I can't recall any. And it was after I left that I started to hear that there were some people that had developed uh, beryllium disease. That wasn't something that you all were planning in terms of health physics? Well, it was, it was the, the uh, oversee of the, of the uh, beryllium operations was, was under the uh, general health physics organization. Uh -huh. um, we had an industrial hygienist whose uh, uh, responsibility was in that area, yes. Uh -huh. And there, there again, uh, I was involved enough closely enough that I, I, I know that uh, uh, the guidelines that had been set down for, uh, for uh, brilliam and air, uh, I don't think were ever exceeded, but that's not to say that, that those guidelines weren't too high. They, you know, they could have been too high. Uh, but uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, as I understand it, brilliam is, uh, uh, there's a sort of a, individual sensitivity to the material, so some people are much more tolerant to it than others. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was it like, how would you characterize your work there over the years? I mean, did you feel that, um, were there changes in terms of how, it, um, you know, the teamwork or anything like that? Well, um, the first, uh, oh, the first, uh, let's see, 52 to 76, I'd say that uh, the teamwork within the health physics department was, uh, was wonderful. Um, we, uh, we had a, a, a superintendent of, of the organization that, uh, promoted uh, uh, an atmosphere in which all of us at his staff level were able to contribute, whether it was in our department or not. We, we, we were very open in our sharing of ideas and thoughts. And I think some of the, some of the development of instrumentation that, that we were responsible for, the development of, of, um, of uh, respiratory equipment, which uh, we were we we did along with uh, with companies like Mine Safety Appliance and Wilson Company and so forth um, came about because we we had a group that was tightly knit and if we uh, electronics and health physics and you know in the laboratory we we all. Uh, shared our thoughts and opinions and, and uh, complemented each other from the standpoint of what was needed. And if uh, the dosimetry group uh, needed to do something uh, different, you know, we could cooperate in the buildings to make sure they had what they needed and so forth. Uh, and this, this went on, you know, uh, like I said, in 1976 and uh, under the uh, Dow organization. And, and then there was a number of, of uh, organizational changes that came up in 76, and I, uh, I guess I'll have to, I won't get into any details, but I'll have to say that, that we sort of lost some of that uh -huh. after when, 76. When there was a change in contract. Right, right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we needed an instrument, a uh, specific kind of instrument in the operating area, uh, it was a joint effort on our part and the electronics to to come to uh, some plan to develop it or get it or whatever. Uh, this is in contrast to to places where these departments are separated and set apart and about all you can do if you needed something to operate and you send it up to those folks and say do this for me and that's you don't see them you know until they think they've got something uh, so uh, we had that kind of an atmosphere going on out there that was tremendous and the same thing was true in, in dosimetry um, as far as uh, even though I was my job was in operations 
uh, health physics operations out in the, uh, for the buildings. Um, I worked very closely with the dosimetry people in development of improved badges and improved capabilities for for measuring measuring the radiation. And because uh, you really have to know the operating area and what's needed out there in order to develop what 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 you're going to do about it in in another area. So uh, so we had we had very close close. Uh, Cooperation. Mm -hmm. um, now let's see. You you retired in eighty two. Mm -hmm. Did you did you just kind of decide? I mean, uh, was it time for you to retire? Well, there was a couple of reasons I retired. <clears throat> uh, I had uh, reached the point uh, where I was able to re uh, get full retirement. Uh, my children were. Uh, uh, through college, um, and I had started to develop uh, coronary artery problems and uh, so forth, and uh, and frankly, I thought some of it might be from the pressures of work and so forth, and I, I just decided that I was going to retire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And have you done anything since then involving? Uh, the uh, I've been involved with uh, uh, as a consultant to some of these uh, attorneys that have uh, been involved with some of these uh, lawsuits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you at, li at liberty to say what? Or is that I can't because uh, the one I'm still pending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see, um, even before you retired, there were s some of the protests were just beginning. Did that, um, did you have thoughts or feelings about that? Well, um, I think there was, I remember the start of the, you might say the start of the anti-nuclear movement, I call it, it probably took place in the, uh, last half of the 60s. And the reason I say that is because uh, uh, we had we had a tremendous workload out there <coughs> and we we did exceed some exposure external exposure to some people and it became a, a big issue uh, that we had done this, and it was probably a lot of it was the pressure that had come from the anti-nuclear group and the, you might say, the spin-off that got into the uh, Atomic Energy Commission and so forth from the standpoint of, of trying to avoid, you know, situations that would be f food for their uh, movement. So uh, I, I think I saw some of that going on, <coughs> and, then, and then unfortunately we had the fire in '69 right then too, and uh, and uh, so uh, there was a the plant. In the meantime, it had become, you might say, more open from the standpoint of what was going on and so forth. And uh, so I think, I, I think uh, that that there was a lot of things that went on then that that were that made it a little more. We were a little more aware, you know, that the, uh, we we had a public looking at us. Yeah, yeah. And you feel like the '69 <coughs> fire was at least one contributor. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, in contrast to the 57 fire, which, which uh, there was practically no publicity about it at all, you know, and no, no concern about it uh, in the general area that uh, was very evident at all. Mm -hmm. With the 69 fire, you know, really um, caused a lot of uh, concern in the area. Mm -hmm. And I think there was even a, a um an inquiry at the uh, federal level. Mm -hmm. so, uh, did, were you involved well, in that? Uh, only from the standpoint of uh, 
supplying information. The uh, the uh, Atomic Energy Commission and what I referred to as, ma as their manual chapters, which were part of the contract for the operation of the plant, and they were uh, they included the various requirements for for uh, radiation protection as well as other things. They uh, they had. Um, uh, uh, developed uh, a, a reporting type of, of uh, program from this category standpoint. If they had, uh, I'm trying to remember what these all these were, but um, there were three levels of, of reporting. There was an A and a B and a C incident type of reporting, and a C incident was was rather minor if uh, someone were re overexposed or received more than the, the standard for a quarter, for example, uh, then there was, there was a certain requirement of, of reporting that. And, and as things got more serious, uh, then they went into the B and the A category as far as, as how much investigation was required for them. Uh, and when you got to a certain point, then <coughs> it required a uh, uh, an investigation at at the level, including the uh, Topic en Energy Commission itself. So the uh, like the '69 fire, you know, that was headed by a gentleman out of Washington, the uh, the investigation board. So uh, and they bring in. They brought in uh, people from from other plant sites and so forth as part of that board, and they spent a lot of time trying to look at the cause and effects and so forth of that. So you you did have all these various levels of uh, of, of reporting that uh, took place depending on the seriousness of whatever might have happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did that cause you any? Consternation that there was so much more publicity after the 69 fire. Well, uh, yes. Uh, I, I don't know if, if that's the right word or not, but uh, uh, we it, it created a situation where we we felt we had to open ourselves up much more to the public. So we developed speakers bureau, a speakers bureau where a lot of us participated to go out and, and tell the story, so to speak. Um, we, were, we were interviewed at times by uh, the press, and, uh, and uh, that was always a you know, rather stressful situation. Um, things, things of that nature, anyway, that, that, that came about when, uh, you know, especially after that 69 fire that uh, from then on, so, uh, and then of course the the, <laughs> the, uh, the local protesters. Of course, they always uh, created a situation that you know wasn't always that comfortable. So, uh -huh. can you say a bit more about that? Well, I was frankly I wasn't close enough to it to say to say much more about it except to observe observe them uh, out on the. Do you highway think it had and so an forth. Impact on the workers in general? Not really. Mm -hmm. no. no. What do you think are, you know, what, what, uh, what are some of the best things about working at Rocky Flats for you? Well, <clears throat> I, I think the. Uh, the, the best thing for me was that uh, I, I felt like comfortable in the job for most of those years. I, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, create as well as, uh, you know, because uh, we, we were in a pioneering stage, you might say, in the nuclear industry at the time. Uh, there wasn't a lot of things commercially available, so you either had to make things do with what you had, uh, or you develop some of what you had, or you worked with with uh, manufacturers 
to come up with what you needed and things of that nature and that was that was very satisfying to uh, you know in those early early years to do that and uh, of course the other thing was uh, uh, I always felt very comfortable with the my co-workers out there uh, both within the department and outside the department uh, I, uh, I was uh, I, I, I was I always had a good feeling about the Dow Chemical Company and the way it treated its people. Um, they, uh, I, I couldn't I don't see how you could be treated more anybody could be treated more fairly than than they treated you. So uh, it it was uh, it was a pretty good life, but. Uh, by the time I was uh, got into the into the uh, late seventies and eighties, I was uh, I was getting ready to to leave because uh, the uh, there were uh, the atmosphere wasn't as great as it as it had been, and so. What were some of the most difficult things about working at Rocky? Well, in the early years, years it was getting there <laughs> on a bumpy road, <laughs> uh -huh. and the wind—you know, uh, the high winds that you get out in that part of the country, and and the damage that it creates to your automobile and and uh, things of that nature. So. So that was always a always a challenge, but that re of course didn't have much of anything to do with the work. But um, and then you so, said the stress. Yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, when 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 uh, I think there's a lot of stress involved when, uh, from the standpoint of uh, of uh, you might say having uh, more and more press and so forth, looking over your shoulder, <laughs> or, uh, or more and more criticism, or reading in the paper articles that you you know the person who wrote it has no idea what what some of the terminology is because they don't use it right, <laughs> and you wanna you want to uh, correct them on it, but you know there's no point in it, so things of that nature, but. Uh, there was, you know, there's been a lot of criticism in the press. I think that that was hard to take because a lot of it uh, didn't think was warranted. So well, you personally, uh, do you think, did, did you think much about the, the product <coughs> or products of, of Rocky Flats and did that have an impact on, you know, how you thought about your work? Not really. I, I guess I guess I feel that uh, that the overall mission of Rocky Flats was essential. Uh, we were doing a, a, a job out there that that really had to be done from the standpoint of world politics, and uh, uh, I guess I felt proud because I was part of it, and. Uh, was that so, part of why you chose to work there, do you think? Well, um, I, I guess I can't really say that that's part of why I chose to work there because, you know, the uh, uh, when I s signed up for it, I really didn't know what I was, uh, what uh, you know, the security of the place was such that I really didn't know in detail what I was getting into. Um, when I... Uh, when I uh, I don't know whether I mentioned, but yes, I guess I did that I had spent this time at uh, Las, uh, Las Vegas test site and working with the Los Alamos people and uh, and by that time I already knew I was going to be at Rocky Flats uh, and uh, they sort of gave him, gave me some hints that it was part of the weapons complex uh, and that a lot of the operations you know that uh, uh, would be in, involved, with, like the uh, Los Alamos was involved in it. So, um, but you didn't know. So, but I didn't know in detail, you know, what what it was all about. 
and uh, I, I didn't know how much demand you know there would be uh, from the standpoint of of uh, protection from plutonium. You know, I wasn't familiar, but I sure learned in Los Alamos what plutonium is all about. So uh, when I came came back, when I got back to Rocky Flats that summer, I had a pretty good idea of what it was. Is, is there anything that um, we <coughs> haven't touched on or I haven't asked you that you think, you know, would, is interesting or would be important for people to know? I really can't think of anything more. No. Well. Maybe we should stop here. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.